and then also over to Second Peter chapter number 2, that I encourage you to kind of keep your Bible uh, handy. Uh, we're going to be going to another passage of Scripture at another point and reading some things there uh, as well, so please keep your uh, Bibles handy. The Bible says, now tonight, as, as you're turning, we're looking at uh, the connection between faithfulness and conviction. Uh, we said a couple of weeks ago uh, when we were in this study, uh, or this particular part of our study, that conviction can be defined in two ways. Last time we looked at one of those definitions, tonight we're going to look at the other. Uh, and so I pray that this will be a blessing tonight uh, as we get into this second definition. But in Genesis chapter number 6, verse number 22, the Bible says, Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Then in 2 Peter chapter number uh, 2 and verse number 5, it says, and speaking of God, it says, And spared not the old world, but saved Noah the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I ask now that you would just hide me behind Calvary, allow me to share the truths that you've given me as we continue our study on this connection between faithfulness and conviction. Father, I pray it will speak to our hearts. In the day in which we live, this second definition, especially I believe, is going to be critical to our success in being able to be faithful witnesses for you in the world that we find ourselves in, another yet, yet another faithless generation. So, Father, touch us, uh, touch me. I pray that you'd use me to be a blessing and then touch us and allow us to be the faithful witnesses that you'd have us to be. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, in the message last time, we, be, we talked about this connection between faithfulness and conviction. And as I said, there's basically two definitions. The first sense of conviction is, the, is in the sense of convincing someone of error or convincing someone of sin by compelling them to admit the truth. Uh, that's really, really fancy, but everybody knows what I'm talking about if you think about it for just a second, because we talk about people who are under conviction. Uh, especially when God's dealing with them about the need that they have to be saved. And what we're saying when we say that someone's under conviction, or when somebody is struggling, uh, with, uh, even a Christian struggling with a sin in their life, and God's trying to help, re help them see the need of ridding that sin from their life, He burdens their heart and He shows them how sinful that is, or the fact that there's only one way to heaven, and He uses the Holy Spirit of God and the Word of God and, and the people of God to show them the, the error that they're in and the need that they have to either be saved or to forsake the sin that is weighing on them. So we use that term, someone being under conviction. And last time we talked about that, and, 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 and as we said, Noah had to first realize just how sinful that sin was in his own life. And that connection or that conviction is what fueled his life of faithfulness to God. Just like Joseph would say in a later chapter in the book of Genesis, he said, how can I sin so greatly against God? But at the same time, that conviction-fueled life also allowed him to preach to a lost world about righteousness. Because as he spoke, he was living that life of righteousness himself. And not only his words, but also the life that he was living was a witness to the truth of the fact that God should, must, and would judge sin. And from Noah's example, we learned that not only, or that, or that only when our sinfulness has been made real to us, can we really become preachers of righteousness in a righteous way. Without a conviction of my own sinfulness and just how much I've been forgiven of, I'll be preaching in hypocritical self-righteousness and not true righteousness. And if I'm convinced of my own sinfulness, then my life and my words are going to match up and they're going to be going in the same direction. And just like Noah, the preaching that we do, whether it's by word or whether it's by uh, the life that we live, will show people the truth of the things that we say. And now that leads us to the second definition of conviction we're going to look at here tonight. And that definition is simply this. A strong persuasion or a belief about something. A strong persuasion or a belief about something. We talk about people having convictions 
or people living a life of conviction. That's what this definition is about. It's having that persuasion or that belief about something that you hold on to and that impacts the way that you live your life. So the first thing we're going to look at tonight is the importance of that kind of conviction. If you go back to chapter to Genesis chapter number 5 and read verses 28 and 29, you read something really interesting here. And Lamech lived 182 years and begat a son. And he called his name Noah, saying, This same, or this same Noah, shall comfort us concerning our work and toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord hath cursed. Lamech, I believe, was speaking prophetically here, much in the same way that, uh, his, uh, that Noah's grandfather Enoch had spoken prophetically concerning uh, his son Methuselah. Remember that Methuselah means when he dies, it will come. And it was obviously a reference to Enoch's preaching of judgment recorded for us in Jude verses 14 and 15. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, and of all the hard species which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. And that was the message of Enoch. And Enoch says, when Methuselah dies, it will come. And in the year that Methuselah died, sure enough, the flood was loosed upon the earth. Now, we see the son of Methuselah, Lamech, naming his son Noah. And Noah's name means comfort and rest. And Lamech ties it to the curse upon the, that God brought upon the world uh, because of sin, when he talks about the earth. Again, listen, think about what Lamech said in chapter 5, and then listen to what God says in Genesis chapter 3. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake, in sorrow thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. But here's what I want us to see tonight. Lamech's naming of Noah wasn't only prophetic about what was coming with the judgment of God. It was also an act of instilling in Noah a vision and a conviction uh, for his life. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, Noah knew from the earliest days of his life that his life had purpose. And that purpose was tied to the plans of God. That knowledge would lead to a true conviction that how Noah lived would be important. Not only what he did, but how he did it and why he did it. And not only what he said, but how he said it and why he said it. We see a picture of that in the book of Ecclesiastes in chapter number 9 and verse number 10. Listen to this. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. Now, just in that one verse, we see three things. We see the what. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it. We see the how. With thy might. And we see the why. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave, whither thou goest. Solomon is saying here that whatever occupation you find yourself in, to not only do it, but to do it with the best of your ability, because the day will come when you'll not be able to do it at all. Then, in the New Testament, you see the same kind of thing in Colossians chapter number 3 and verses 23 through 25. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of purpose or persons. Here you see it again, the what. And whatsoever ye do, do it. You see the how heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. And then you see the why. Knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. 
Paul says here that whatever we, uh, whatever we do, we need to do it heartily because we are, with all that we have because we know that we're ultimately serving Christ in every area of our life. Noah was raised with the encouragement from the very get-go that he was a part of God's plan. And that encouragement led him to the conviction that he needed or to have the conviction that he needed to be faithful to God. And folks, can I say something tonight? That's what we need to be doing with our children and our grandchildren. That's what we need to be doing with the children that we have an opportunity to teach in Sunday school and in Awanas and in the youth and in vacation Bible school and all of those kind of things. We need to be teaching our children from the earliest days that God has them here for a purpose. And part of our responsibility as the adults is to help them find their place in the plan of God. And when we do that, we can instill in them from the very earliest days that persuasion or that belief that they're here to do something great for God. But then secondly, we need to see the difference between preference and conviction. And this is one of those things that I could get on a soapbox and we could be here forever. So I'm going to try to be good and stay kind of on point. But the first question we have to ask is, what is the difference? Ultimately, what is the difference between conviction and preference? Because the truth is, many Christians live their Christian life more on preference than they do conviction. Now, the easiest way to sum up the difference between the two is this. Preference requires a decision. Conviction requires a commitment. Did you get that? Preference requires a decision. But conviction requires a commitment. Preferences can change as our circumstances change because the circumstance that we're in may lead us to a totally different decision this time than one that we've made in the past. But, <coughs> excuse me, but convictions are based on a solid commitment that we've made. Commitments are non-negotiable even in changing times. And as a matter of fact, those conviction or, convictions are made all the more important as things around us do change. Very rarely, and, and this is a key, another key way of understanding the difference, very rarely does a preference cost us anything. But commitments at some point usually do. Preferences usually don't cost us anything. But convictions at some point usually do. Now, first off, let me say, that doesn't mean that preferences necessarily are a bad thing. Uh, for instance, I prefer, when I'm studying, I prefer to use real books. I've got a whole library at my house, and my wife, every time I go to the bookstore, she just shakes her head. Because I have books sitting on top of books, sitting on top of books, and I have big containers, Rubbermaid containers, in my, in my basement of books that I'm currently just not using. But I will not get rid of them because I know just as soon as I throw them out next week, I will need one of them. So I've got book on top of book on top of book on top of book. And when I'm studying, if I'm at the house, I'm going to study from my books. But I probably have two-thirds of my library on my computer. Two. Now, while I prefer to use a real book, I can't take them all with me. I can take my computer, my little Surface Pro right here. And I've got, like I said, probably two-thirds or better and a lot of books on here that I don't even have at home. And so I can study at work. My preference is to have my books. But I don't care to violate my preference if necessity says you can't take every book you own. So preferences are not necessarily bad in and of themselves. When circumstances dictate, you can set aside a preference to do something else. And again, that's one way to tell the difference between a preference and a conviction. Am I willing to change what I'm doing 
because of how convenient something is or because of how inconvenient something is? Am I willing to change what I'm doing because of convenience? Think about this. I can say that the Bible is important to live, for me to live the way that God wants me to live. But if I never read the Bible outside of church, and I never seek to apply the truths of God that I've heard when I am in church, and I never try to apply those to my life, is my statement a preference, or is it a conviction? If, if it's a conviction... That conviction will drive me to spend time reading it and meditating on it and studying it and seeking to apply its teachings to my life. It's going to require effort. It will require choices to be made. And the truth of the matter is, I may read something in Scripture one day and it become really inconvenient. You know, like one of those, if you've sinned against your brother, go tell him that you're sorry. That ain't always convenient. And it sure ain't no fun. If it's a conviction, though, it will require the choice to be made. If it's just a preference, I can still say it, but it won't really change things in my life to make it a priority. Uh, the same is true of church attendance. You know, you can, uh, church attendance is important, but if you're only here once every so often, is that a preference or is that a conviction? You can say witnessing to people is important. But if you never do it, is it a preference or is it a conviction? Just this past week, and I, this is a great example of how these two things can play off each other. Just this past week, Sabrina and I traded cars. Now, in that trade, part of it was necessity because the Honda was dying. I was literally concerned it was going to die before we got it to the leadership. And that's not a joke. And so we got up there and we'd kind of been looking and we kind of had this particular car that we liked the one that's out there in the, in, in the church parking lot we really liked that car but we had a conviction that we had to stay in a particular price range as far as what we were willing to pay for a month and trust me that number limited our choices considerably and I, I, mean, I love it. You're sitting there in the car lot and the guy looks at you and he goes, oh, you work hard, you deserve it. Yeah, but I need to pay for it. You know, and, and, and so, you know, <laughs> I deserve it. You pay for it for me and we'll be good. You know, <laughs> you know, there was, you know we had a conviction. This is what our monthly payment needs to be. And because of that, we looked at a lot of cars we were like, that's nice, but we walked away. When we were looking at houses, I mean, you know, we knew this was what our monthly payment could be. And we told the realtor we were dealing with, if you show us a house outside of that price range, we're going to leave. And she said, why? And I said, because I know what's going to happen. We're going to go into a house we can't afford and like it. And then you're going to show us a house we can't afford and we're not going to be happy. Do not take us to a house we cannot afford. She did anyway. We dropped her. And we got somebody else. I'm not kidding. That's how serious we were about it. The conviction said, here's the price of the car you can afford, so you go with that. And we stuck to that. But the color was not a conviction. Neither of us really wanted a black car. But it met all the criteria that we needed in a car. It was in the price range. It even had some pretty cool bells and whistles. My wife is the happiest person in the world because she now has a heated seat. But the preference was not black or white. What do we have? A black car. The preference was the color. The conviction was the price. The conviction won out the preference, we were like, oh, well, guess we'll buy one of them $20, $29 a month, all you can wash your cars, and we'll just run it through every now and then. But that was the basis of the decision that we made. And again, that's another preference or a difference between preference and convictions. Preferences usually revolve around short-term satisfaction. 
I like this color, but I don't like that one. Where convictions are based on a long-term view, and sometimes it's based even on an eternal view. I need to minimize my debt and my payments so I can do other things that God wants me to do. Now, one of the most beautiful examples, and it's a passage of Scripture that very few people have probably have ever read, unless you're one of these people who I encourage to read the Bible every year. But I, I don't know in my entire life if I've ever heard anybody preach a message on this passage. But there's a beautiful passage in the Old Testament that shows how important convictions are. And it's Jeremiah chapter number 35. Go over there with me. Jeremiah chapter number 35. And we're going to read about a family. A family known as the Rechabites. All right? Jeremiah chapter number 35. And we're going to read about the Rechabites. <laughs> we'll start reading in verse number 1. Jeremiah 35, verse number 1. The word which came unto Jeremiah from the Lord in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, say, Go unto the house of the Rechabites, and speak unto them, and bring them into the house of the Lord into one of the chambers, and give them wine to drink. Well, that's a pretty straightforward command, wasn't it? Bring the Rechabites into the house of God in one of the chambers, and give them wine to drink. Then I took Jeazaniah, the son of Jeremiah, the son of Hasbazaniah, and his brethren, and all his sons, and the whole house of the Rechabites. And I brought them into the house of the Lord, into the chamber of the sons of Hanan, the son of uh, Igdaliah, a man of God, which was by um, the chamber of the princes, which was above the chamber of Maasiah, the son of Shalom, the keeper of the door. And I set before the sons of the house of the Rechabites pots full of wine and cups. And I said unto them, drink ye wine. But they said, you get that? But they said, we will drink no wine. For Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father, commanded us, saying, ye shall drink no wine, neither ye nor your sons forever. Neither shall ye build house, nor sow seed, nor plant vineyard, nor have any, but all your days ye shall dwell in tents, that ye may live many days in the land where ye be strangers. Thus have we obeyed the voice of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father, in all that he hath charged us to drink no wine all our days, we, our wives, our sons, nor our daughters, nor to build houses for us to dwell in, neither have we vineyard, or field, nor seed. But we have dwelt in tents and have obeyed and done according to all that Jonadab our father commanded us. But it came to pass when Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up into the land that we said, Come and let us go to Jerusalem for fear of the army of the Chaldeans and for fear of the army of the Syrians. So we dwell at Jerusalem. Then came the word of the Lord unto Jeremiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. Go and tell the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, Will ye not receive instruction to hearken to my words, saith the Lord? The words of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, that he commanded his sons not to drink wine or perform, but for unto this day they drink none, but obey their father's commandment. Notwithstanding, I have spoken unto you, rising early and speaking, but ye hearken not unto me. I have sent also unto you all my servants, the prophets, rising up early and sending them, saying, Return ye now every man from his evil way, and amend your doings, and go not after other gods to serve them. And ye shall dwell in the land which I have given to you and to, and to your fathers, but ye have not inclined your ear, nor hearkened unto me. Because the sons of Jonadab, the sons of Rechab, have performed the commandment of their father, which he commanded them, but this people hath not hearkened unto me. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will bring upon Judah and upon all the inhabitants of Jerusalem all the evil that I have pronounced against them. Because I have spoken unto them, but they have not heard, and I have called unto them, but they have not answered. And Jeremiah said unto the house of the Rechabites, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Because ye have obeyed the commandment of Jonadab your father, and kept all his precepts, and done according to all that he hath commanded you, therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Jonadab, the son of Rechab, shall not want a man to stand before me forever. How many times have you ever heard that story? Now, here's the backstory on all of this. 
If you go to 2 Kings chapter number 10, we see there Jehu destroying the descendants of the evil King Ahab. Along the way, he meets up with this Jonadab that you read about here in the passage. And, and, and he tells Jonadab, Jehu does, he tells Jonadab to come with him and that Jahab, the reason, or Jehu is going to go to destroy the prophets of Baal. Jonadab goes and after an amazing bit of deception of the priests of Baal, Jehu rids the northern kingdom of all Baal worship. But his heart wasn't right with God. Even though he rid the country of Baal worship, he continued to worship other idols, those specifically that had been set up by Jeroboam. Now, this is what I believe happened when you put these two passages together. While Jonadab at first was impressed by Jehu upon seeing that he truly wasn't a king whose heart was turned after God, he realized that in the end, God was still going to, jo God was still going to judge the northern kingdom. And this is what I kind of believe happened as we tie the passages in 2 Kings and Jeremiah together. Jonadab tells his family, abstain from any wine so that you can be alert. Don't set down roots. Don't build houses. Don't build farms. Don't do any of those kind of things because God is going to judge. In other, but in, instead, take occupations that will allow you to move at a minute's notice. Living in tents. Take occupations that allow you to move in a heartbeat so you can be preserved. God's judgment may not come in my lifetime. It might not even come in your lifetime. So make sure you pass this commandment down through every generation so that they can be safe when the time of judgment comes. And do this wherever you go. And that's evidently what happened. When Assyria took the northern kingdom, the Bible says here that the, the Rechabites moved quickly to the southern kingdom of Judah. They were in the northern king of Israel, or the kingdom of Israel. As soon as Assyria came, they packed up their tents, moved into the southern kingdom of Judah because they had tents. Then later on, when Nebuchadnezzar came on the scene and he began to take over the land of Judah, what did they do? They moved into Jerusalem. Why? Because they lived in tents. They could pack everything up and they could go in and they were never drunk. They didn't have to worry about wine. They didn't have to worry about their possessions. Any of that kind of stuff. They were clear-headed and their life was based on the conviction. Our forefathers said we needed to do this to keep ourselves safe. So now they're in Jerusalem. God's about to send Nebuchadnezzar to destroy the city of Jerusalem. And God promises the Rechabites because of their conviction, you will not be destroyed you will always have a man standing before me. Now, to put this in kind of in picture here, or perspective, between the time of Jonadab's commandment to his first son, from the time of that first commandment, don't drink wine, don't build houses, don't sow seed, all of those kind of things, from the time of that first commandment until the events we read about in Jeremiah chapter number 35 was 300 years. Our country is only 243 years old. So for longer than we've been a nation, this family did exactly what God or what their father, Jonadab, told them to do as a means of preserving their lives and preserving their families. It cost them pleasure. It cost them permanent homes. It cost them a settled existence. But man, it gave them so much more. It gave them wisdom. It gave them protection. And it gave them an eternal blessing. That's the outcome of conviction. But as parents, there's something that we really need to heed here. Parents, grandparents, teachers, whatever. Lamech passed down his conviction to Noah by giving him vision and direction. Jonadab passed down his convictions to his descendants by giving them commands and instructions. And we have to do the same for our children today. Our children, our grandchildren, the children that God has given us to be a blessing to and to mentor and to teach here at Holy Mountain Baptist Church. We say that our children are a blessing from God. But how often do we tell them that? Have we shared with them that they 
very presence on this earth is a sign that God wants to use them for his glory? Have we lived a life of conviction in front of them so that our words to them actually carry some kind of weight instead of them looking at us and go, well, what he's saying is, is do as I say and not as I do. Are we truly raising them in the nurture and the admonition and the fear of the Lord so that they will have direction and instructions for their lives? Remember, conviction isn't so much concerned about the short term as it is the long term. Can you say that you're living a life of conviction before your children, before your grandchildren, before the children you have an opportunity to teach, before your neighbors, and even before your co-workers? That's the difference between preference and conviction. And then lastly, we need to see that Bible-based convictions will give you strength during the trials. Another important, like I said, another important thing about conviction is faithfulness is that convictions will give you something to stand on when things get hard. Noah had a settled conviction that God was holy and that he was going to judge. He had a conviction that if God called him to build an ark, then God would help him to do it. He had a conviction that if God said the ark would preserve him and his family, that it would do so. And he built the ark, the Bible says, to the saving of his household. And he did it despite the reviling and the ridicule and the threats and the anger of those who would not listen to his message. Peter speaks to this in his first epistle. Listen to the words of 1 Peter 3, verses 13 through 17. And who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? But, and if you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are you, and be not afraid of their terror, for, or neither be troubled. But sanctify, or set apart. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that's in you with meekness and fear having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. For it's better, if the will of God be so, that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. Notice from where Peter says at least part of our fortitude and part of our strength and courage come from, comes from when we're facing being reviled and ridiculed or mocked or made fun of. Verse, seven, verse 15 says that it comes from knowing what we believe and why we believe it. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that's in you. Know what you believe and know why you believe it. Have a conviction about why you're living the way that you're living. Have a conviction so strong that not only do you know what you believe and not only do you know why you believe it, but have that conviction strong enough that when the time comes and you're asked about it, you're willing to tell them. Despite the persecution. Isn't that conviction? And notice that verse 16 says again that a faithful life based on conviction uh, will allow the Holy Spirit to work His conviction in their life. Having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. If you have the conviction of, in, in your life that this is how I need to live and this is where I need to stand and this is what I need to do, and you know why you believe that, and you stand on those things, as a Christian in the world that we're living in today, I can guarantee you, you will be ridiculed. You will be mocked. You will have people call you things and say you're ignorant and say and, and, and that, you know, why are you letting a book that was written 2,000 years ago by a bunch of farmers and shepherds and fishermen control how you live in the 21st century? I've heard that one be perfectly honest with you. Conviction. You know why you believe, you know what you believe, you know why you believe it, and you share why you believe it. 
And what the Bible says is, they'll still look at you and call you an idiot. And that's if they're being nice. They'll still mock you. They'll still make fun of you. They'll still ridicule you. But the whole time you're standing and you're living that life of conviction and you're standing on those convictions and you're sharing those convictions, if you're doing it because you're doing it to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says the Holy Spirit of God say, in that other person's life, isn't that amazing? I can't make them stand down. I wonder why they're so confident. I wonder what it is about this Jesus that makes them be willing to be mocked and persecuted and in some cases in our brothers and sisters around the world beaten or killed. If we live a life of conviction, our convictions will give us the strength to stand in the hard times. And in that standing and in our testimony, the Holy Spirit of God will work in the, hand of the, in the heart and the head of the reviler to show them that Jesus really is who he says that he is. And that he can make a change in their life just like he's made it in yours. Bible-based conviction will give you courage in the hard times. All of us, as believers, should be living lives based on conviction. A conviction, first of all, that God's holy and that he will judge sin. A conviction that Christ is the only way to heaven. A conviction that God's word is inspired, it's inerrant, it's infallible, and it's important in how we live and in the choices we make. A conviction that Christ will one day return and that one day God will judge. And a conviction that holy lives on our part show a lost world what Christ can do in their lives. Today, we, we've looked at the second definition of conviction. A strong belief or a strong persuasion about something. Living a faithful life requires conviction and conviction requires commitment and it will impact and it will often change the way that you live. Convictions are based on a long term and sometimes even an eternal view of life and it's not so much concerned with the short term gains and losses. It will often cost us something but the truth of the matter is it will pay much greater dividends than we can ever imagine. Convictions are best, and, and this is the one thing I want you to get. Convictions are best passed down through a family that has a vision for what's important and where they want to go. And the convictions then in turn provide direction when circumstances change or decisions need to be made. The immediate family, but I say this again, also within the church family. Don't get me wrong, and I, and, you know, I know we've got all of our, most of our teachers, or a lot of our teachers are downstairs right now. But let me say this: parents, grandparents, we're the first line, no doubt. But as a church family. As a church family, I teach the Word of God. Our responsibility is in turn to support them and teach the Word of God as well. There's a reason God calls us a family because family matters. And when it comes to convictions through family. Father, we love you. And we thank you so much for the truth of your word. Father, help us to see the connection between faithful living and conviction. 
not only the conviction of, how, of our own sinfulness and the need that we have to live righteously so that our message will be accepted as coming from God and not, from our, not just from us, but help us to be people of conviction, that we pass from one generation to the next why we believe what we believe and why it's important and what it can do for them in the future so that when the time comes... And it may not happen in our lifetime, but it will surely happen in a lifetime somewhere down the road that because of what we've passed on, they've been able to stand. And help, Father, help us in our day to stand. And as Paul says in the book of Ephesians, and having done all, to stand. We love you. We ask that you would help us to be people of conviction. We ask it in the sweet and precious name of Jesus. And amen. Amen. All hearts.